Hello, it is the Bossit Podcast again. The podcast for software executives, entrepreneurs, senior executives, shareholders, anybody in the software sector, really, that's what it's all about. And I talk to a variety of people that I think would be of interest to people that are, are running software development companies. We cover a whole host of issues. And if you've got an interesting story to tell me, then please do get in touch. The last couple of weeks, before I introduce my guest, I just wanted to say that the last couple of weeks, we seem to have had lots of feedback about the podcast. This probably is going to be the final episode of season two, where I've been interviewing quite a wide range of people. Season three, based upon some of the feedback I've had, I'm going to be interviewing more people, CEOs of software companies people that have started founders of software companies, perhaps software veterans, talking about some of their war stories, talking about some of the things that they've learned. And in fact, um, I've already started doing a few of those recordings, but they'll, they'll drop into season three. But today I have got Stephen Hoffman, who I believe is quite an experienced uh, podcaster. He's got a very interesting platform that he has that he's developed called Founders Space, which is all about st helping startups. And he's also written a book called Surviving the Startup. So hello, Stephen Hoffman. Mark, fantastic to be here. Tell me, tell me a bit about yourself. So we, we'll get to Founders Space and we'll talk a little bit about your book and what you're doing. But what did you want to be when you were a boy? I wanted to be so many things, I can't even remember. So I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be a game designer, but I never expected to be what I am today, which is a venture capitalist, entrepreneur, and writer. Uh, okay. What's the horse about in the background? Is it because you like Ferraris or Lloyd's it Bank? Is <laughs> it is because I have been traveling across the United States for the past four and a half months, and I am in Wyoming right now, in an Airbnb, and they have horses on the wall. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was. It, I thought it was your sort of icon. It was. It was what you use. Okay. So you you had. I suppose most of us have different things that we wanted to be. I wanted to be a photographer, and I was for a while. And then years go by, and you suddenly find, wow, I'm doing this, or I'm doing all of these things. I think that careers are not quite the same as they used to be. And, and you often now get involved in many different things. It is, so, but I, I was actually lucky. I actually became, you know, a filmmaker and Hollywood television development exec. I right. actually became a game designer. It's just that I wound up a venture capitalist and working with startups. Wow. So you designed games, you, became, you were a filmmaker as well. Tell us about filmmaking. What sort of films did you make? So I went to USC film school. So first of all, when I was a child, I made over 50 movies all the way through high school. So wow. I was just prolific in producing films. Yeah. Then I went to USC film school, shot a bunch more films. Then I worked my way up in Hollywood to a television development executive. And that was an amazing experience. And I met the founder of Sega, the big game company. Oh, and yes. at the time they had just surpassed Nintendo as the number one game company. And I saw the future. I thought, you know, I was also a gamer because I'd made, you know, like hundreds of different board games and role-playing games throughout my life. Yes. I thought at this point, computer games are going to surpass the film industry. I know it. So when he offered me a chance to jump uh, to their Japanese headquarters and come up with new ideas for video game concepts, I took it. Wow. And are you still involved with that? I produced a lot of games. I produced so many games, mobile games, PC games, video games. Right now, I fund game companies, but I don't run one. Oh, okay. So what was it excited you that made you make that switch from films to games? Technology. I saw technology enabling people to do a new form of entertainment that I knew, because I was a gamer, that this entertainment was so compelling that it would someday surpass, you know, the total sales would surpass film and television. And it did. Yeah. It, not that long later, because, yeah. you know, interactive entertainment is engaging on a whole nother level. And that just led me down a path. So I have an interesting background. I'm an electrical computer engineer. I can code. I can do all of that. You know, I have a degree in film and television, and I've always been at the intersection of both of those. Mm. 
what do you what do you see and do you have any thoughts about where the the gaming industry is going to go next because i've seen um in fact i went on, i was on a business trip over to belgium and we got involved in a sort of a virtual reality game and I'd not really experienced it before, but I was really impressed. Although <clears throat> it's probably some of it was fairly old technology, and it was it was struggling uh, sometimes. But I could see for the software industry and where the software industry, you know, particularly B two B, which is where I sit, I think that there's um there's a there's another stage of development that needs to happen, which is in the interaction between the software and the and the human being. There's a Absolutely. weakness there. And I Absolutely. think there are, could be aspects of gaming that could come across. So you are right on this. It's the intersection right now between biology and our technology and how we integrate them. And that is not going to just affect gaming. It's going to affect everything we do. But we are going to see more and more advanced user interfaces, interfaces whether they're virtual reality headsets or uh devices that actually stimulate our nerves so that we can actually feel things even though they're not there sense things so all it will take advantage of all our different senses sight sound hearing touch maybe even smell things like that and we will be entering an era of more and more immersive gaming so mm. right now we've been dabbling there you know the virtual reality headsets they are they are the precursor they're still kind of crude they're bulky uh, the interface, the design, getting into them is really difficult. But that, once we surmount those obstacles, and we will, we, mm. uh, it's just a matter of time, and, and these game experiences become lifelike, at that point, it's going to be transformative. I, I mean, I was quite surprised, even with, I don't think it's the, the most up-to-date technology, how engaging these games were. After the first few minutes, once you've got used to the helmets and the goggles with the gun, you really do become very engaged. And I think that that's a really big weakness. I know there are people talking about gamification and, 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 and but I don't, a lot of the software companies that I talk to, they, they create, from my perspective, they create an interface as an afterthought because they have to. They don't see it as actually a critical point of contact. Whereas with gaming, they have to make that experience enjoyable to, so that people come back. And I think because of that, the, the level of expertise has accelerated and there needs to be a meeting of, of minds there. It's, it's true. So traditionally, a lot of enterprise software companies, the interface was an afterthought. However, that, that is starting to change. I mean, it's becoming so competitive now that even enterprise and B2B companies, oh, sure. they, 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 they're starting to realize that the interface can be the difference between their software being number one and them being, you know, one of the followers. Yes. It makes a huge difference. So, but gaming has always been at the forefront and you are absolutely right in that gamers are actually the, the art of interface design. And it is an art and a science yeah. has, has gone to a whole new level because gamers are always experimenting. Like, what could we do more? How can we make this more immersive? How could we make this easier? How could we make this more intuitive? How can we make this a better experience? So what we're gonna see in the future of gaming and where I'm putting my money when I'm investing at Founderspace is we are going to see uh, interfaces that are one more collaborative, like collaborative game playing, people playing together, people taking on different roles within a gaming scenario will be really interesting. So not everybody has the same role or just doing the same thing, but you're all have different expertise. And then gaming that uh, opens up new worlds for people, worlds to explore. So this is going to be really interesting. And then when we combine this with things like the blockchain, NFTs, you know, these whole economies of gaming. So gaming economies are really powerful and they could be, you know, huge economies, billions and billions of dollars. Well, well let me stop. Let me stop you there. Well, you mentioned about blockchain. Where's the connection with blockchain? How do you see that being impactful in that area? So in gaming for a while now, virtual goods have been very valuable. So uh, for gamers. So these are goods like you could be in a role playing game and the sword is extremely, you know, mm. uh, rare and very powerful. And you can sell this to other gamers. Well, the blockchain has enabled, you know, non fungible tokens. And oh, this, I see. Right. This yes. allows people to buy and sell and collect 
these items that only have value within the gaming environment. But mm. saying only is not uh, doesn't diminish their value. In no. fact, with it, if you are into a game, the value could be astronomical. I mean, these things could sell for the price of a car. So yes. So so what we're going to see is these economies will mature. So this has started way back with Second Life and virtual goods, the virtual yeah. world, Second Life, and then it petered out. But there's a whole new wave of these coming and, and it's just going to get more sophisticated and it's going to become a deeper part of people's lives. The, the value they place on, on these virtual items that are being tokenized will be comparable to what we place on actual physical items like our home, our house, our clothes, things like that. Okay. And you mentioned some other technology innovations that you felt that would have an impact. Was that regards people be working together and, and playing games and, and collaborating in teams um, virtually, but also in close connection? Yes. So I, um, in close connection, right? So right Because they could be in the same room. They don't necessarily have to be on the other side of the world. You know, they could be working within an office or there could be a game play where everyone's in the same room. It can be. And uh, in in most cases, though, people will be in different locations, like in their homes or wherever they happen to be. Mm. But there will be a lot of new technologies, sensor technologies, you know, technologies that read. Actually, one of the biggest areas for innovation right now is brain computer interfaces. Because if you think about it, you know, using a gaming controller is clunky, right? And and not that intuitive. But we have devices now that can actually read our brain waves uh, called brain computer interfaces, and they are becoming more and more sophisticated. And at a certain point, we won't need mobile phones. We won't need uh, these control these clunky controllers. We will actually be able to think and interact in the game world just with our mind. That's interesting. I know that there are a number of commercial available devices now that are used in monitoring the brain, but enabling people to train their brain to be able to relax, for instance, or maybe to be able to control a game. So there, there, there could also be some potential um, medical benefits there. Because I know Absolutely. Absolutely. gaming can get, you know, a, quite a lot of negative press. And, and I remember <laughs> years ago, I used to be a youth football coach and I suppose what I was aiming to do was actually to get a lot of the boys away from the computers and sitting down all day, especially during the summer holidays, and actually get them out in the fresh air doing some exercise. And sometimes it was difficult because it could become obsessive, especially for sort of teenagers, young teenagers. They would spend days, all day, all night. So there are, there's, there's a lot of negative aspects to that. There are. What do you think that the gaming industry can do to, to counter that? You know, it's tough to ask an industry to police itself. What game the gaming industry is going to do <laughs> if, if it's not, if, it's, if, if there aren't regulations in place, is they're going to make the most compelling, the most immersive, the most quote unquote addictive games they can sure. make because yes. that's what makes the most money. And yep. we ain't seen nothing yet when we look at the amount of engagement in games right now it will actually go up dramatically yeah. because think about once games become totally lifelike, once you can have these experiences that you could only dream about, you know, like feel like you're really flying, you know, go, you know, surfing, driving a car, but in a game where you can't get hurt and you don't necessarily need the same skill level or the money to do it, it will be, a vi- a people will spend a lot of time in these games and they will form very deep relationships. And the danger is exactly what you pointed out, that they're going to be too good, that we're, we're going to kind of abandon the physical world yes. for these virtual worlds. Yes. That is a real problem. And that is something that our society will have to adapt and contend with, um, depending on what our values are, right? If our society decides that being in a virtual world and spending all your time there is not a problem, right? It's, it's actually a good thing. Then we will, you know, you will see this huge shift um, in that direction. If society decides that we should limit it because it's actually damaging, you know, human beings and human relationships, at that point, uh, we'll have to figure out how uh, to impose limits on, on these very compelling technologies. Yes, but I mean, I suppose with, with, with virtual headsets, um, and I know my experience, limited experience in, with virtual reality, I actually was moving around. I wasn't sitting in a chair. 
I mean, today I sat, sat in this chair at eight o'clock. It's now quarter past five here and I'm still sitting here. Now that isn't healthy and I'm not playing games. I'm, I'm doing business, but that's, that's the way things are. So I suppose there could also be, it would be quite nice if some of the software that we could interact meant that we could move around more freely. And to a certain extent, you know, we have mobiles and you can do that. But I suppose there could be some benefits in using some of that technology to interact on, on a, from a business perspective. You know, That's absolutely you... right. So a lot of, a lot of you know, there's, there's solution for every technical problem, there's a solution. And right now moving around, they have these crazy big devices. They're kind of uh, clunky, but yes. you can actually put them in your living room and they're like treadmills and you can move all around in a virtual yes. reality without hurting yourself, without tripping over a coffee table and yes. <laughs> smashing your head. Yes, that's otherwise it needs to be in a very big warehouse and you need people watching you otherwise. Yeah, I know exactly. What it's like. Yeah. <laughs> Padded walls, whatever you need. <laughs> exactly, bounce it off the walls. Okay, tell us a bit about um, founder space because that sounds interesting so that is is helping startups what type of startups do you focus in any particular area is it just for software companies or any startup so we uh, tend to focus on tech companies and software okay. is actually our core so right. you know we do a little hardware but software tends to be the most profitable the the best use of our capital at this time you know there's yes. so much innovation and then we do some medical devices and other things, but they're really on the fringe. So that's what we do. And founder space is what we call a startup accelerator. So we bring in entrepreneurs who have an idea. They either have a prototype or a product just ready to launch or one already in the market. And we help them go faster. So we help them raise capital. We help them connect with the right people around the world, different marketing people, strategic partners, lawyers, whatever they need to grow their business. Okay. That can be a difficult space to operate in because those companies, those individuals, they don't have money. And, and the failure rate, um, I know, in software is high. So how do, you, how do you make that viable? So what we do is it's a hit-driven business. So it is the venture business. You know, we're just taking these startups at an early stage, mm. uh, infusing them with capital, giving them the help they need to grow. But honestly, most of them will not make it. And I had that, you know, I work with hundreds of entrepreneurs every year. I see the ones, you know, we get better and better at, at really identifying the ones that have potential to make it and then guiding them towards the business models and, you know, the right way to engage customers to increase the odds. But it's tough. Like doing a startup is tough. People don't realize, you yeah. know, most people jump into it with this dream, like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, the next yes. unicorn overnight. But Reality doesn't always turn out that way. And I'm sure you've seen it, um, yeah. you know, in your business. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't work with a lot of startups. Occasionally I do. Um, I tend to work with more established businesses, um, perhaps that are looking for an exit or looking for an acquisition or, or looking just to grow quickly. So we've studied the, the fastest growing companies, you know, the top 1%, slightly less than that, actually, to see what it is that, that makes them so successful. So I, I would be quite interested to hear your perspective on what are the biggest mistakes that startups make? So, yeah, I write about this in my new book, Surviving a Startup, because I think entrepreneurs need to know this. Like, what, yes. you know, what are you doing wrong or what, what do most people do wrong? Well, the number one thing that most people do wrong, which is kind of ironic, is they come up with an idea that they think is brilliant. You know, it's their, their baby. And they go look for in, a problem. <laughs> no, and they fall in love with this idea. Oh, yes. And, yeah. and they go into the world. They like put a lot of time and money into building it. And then they go out and try to convince everybody this idea is great. Like you need this idea. And more often than not, they discover that people don't care. <laughs> they just don't care about the idea. It, it, you know, it, some of them will go, oh, that's nice. But nobody Nobody buys a nice to have idea. You never, no. you know, you see a nice thing. You're like, oh, that's nice. And we've downloaded apps on our phone all the time. Oh, that's nice. A week later, it, we forgot about that app. You can't remember it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we can't even yes. remember it. And then later we delete it, you know, a month later. So I, I think there's, I think sometimes there's confusion there. And this is, that would be actually on, on my checklist when companies come to me and we do give guidance to companies yep. is that they will talk to me about 
their their solution and the fact that there is a problem sometimes there isn't really a problem right but my question to them but is it a big enough problem that people are willing to pay you that amount of money and spend the time because in a business there's going to be lots of problems and lots of solutions that they need and if you're always lower down the priority list they'll probably never get to you and that's, that's the problem with them that's exactly what i say i say who yeah. You know, I ask them, I'm like, you know, who is your target customer? Go to your target customer, the exact person you know yeah. would have this problem and ask them, is it in their top three priorities? Because if it isn't, they're probably never going to get back to you. Like, yeah. They'll nod their head, they'll smile, but they won't get back to you. And, and also is that probably, you know, 90% of the software CEOs and founders that I speak to, they've got a degree in technology. Yep. So their focus is technology. And one of the things I would say to them is go out and pre-sell your solution, go out and test it. Because I think you can also suffer from going to a lot of people and saying, you know, if we created this solution for you, would you be interested? Yeah, 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 I'll be interested. But when you actually go back to them and say, it's going to cost you 50,000, <laughs> hmm, they're not quite so interested because I've seen that as well is companies saying when we did our market research and all of these companies were interested. Yeah. But did you, did you tell them about how much it was going to cost them? That can catch you out. That could completely, you know, it's so easy for somebody to say I'm interested, but it means absolutely nothing. You know, no. the bottom line is what action will they take? You know, I tell entrepreneurs, if, if they say they're interested, that's a no. If, if they tell you, Oh my God, I've been waiting for this. How do I get this? Can I sign yes. up early? Can I? Yes, you know, that's right. Yes. That's when you know you have something. Yes. And you, they need to know how much it's going to cost them as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it, it can't cost too much because price matters. And then the, you know, the thing I tell on, the other thing I tell entrepreneurs, which I think is really important, your job isn't to sell your vision, sell your idea when you start a new, a new project. Your job is to go into the marketplace and hunt for unmet demand. Like you were saying, like there's this pent up demand out there yeah. of uh, people who really, really need something that they're not getting. They might not even know it exists, but when you show it to them, boom, like th they start coming to you. That is the entrepreneurs. Number one, if they want to succeed, they have to kind of look at it like that. It doesn't matter what idea they have. They can go with a lot of different ideas and start testing them. Yeah. What's your, what's your third one? What's the other sort of the, the main problem that you see from startups the thing that you would like to advise people that perhaps are thinking about a startup part of the checklist to make sure they don't fall down the obvious holes so uh, uh, another thing is you, so i i tell you know entrepreneurs don't go in with a specific idea go in with a direction and a lot of ideas in that area and then start the process of discovery yes the other thing on a lot of entrepreneurs especially at the early stage the mistake they make is they try to do it alone they try yeah. to do it like solo entrepreneurs. They don't really, they haven't surrounded themselves with an A team. And I will tell you, if you're an entrepreneur out there, at the beginning, even before you come up with any of your idea, spend 80% of your time at that very early stage, figuring out the people you want to work with, like amazing people, like some amazing technologist, an amazing interface designer, an amazing marketing person that you can bring together as a team, because your chance of success at it, it just by bringing those people in will go up exponential, like then just going out on your own and trying to do something. And as an investor, like I'm an investor, when I look at an early stage startup that's, you know, pre-traction, meaning it doesn't have a lot of sales or growth yet. Yes. Um, what I'm looking at is can that CEO really be a leader? Because, you know, nobody builds a billion dollar company by themselves. Like you never no. do it. Like no. it doesn't matter if you're Elon Musk, you no. need other people. That's so, true. So I tell them, like your first test is can you get people who could work for Microsoft or Google or Facebook to forego their jobs and actually invest their time and, and their lives in you, in you right? Yes. If you can do that, you're a great leader. And I think you will figure it out eventually. Yes. I, I like to get to understand that founder and understand their background because quite a lot of the time it will give you an indication as to the type of business they're likely to build. Yes. And and if they're not open or willing to be aware of their weaknesses, which we all have, none of us are experts in every single, all of the, the sort of the component parts. I always look at a business like a Coliseum. 
with the different columns. And the more of those columns you have in place, the more stable your business is going to be. And technology tends to be, in the software sector, one of the solid columns. And they've got technology that really works. And some of those entrepreneurs come to me and they think that people are going to come and bash down the door because it works. That is just a given. Of course it works. All of the software's got to work. If you're coming to me with software and saying, well, ours works, are you expecting the rest of the industry to have software that doesn't work at all? And their view on how well it works. I mean, the, the honest truth is that the best solutions aren't the necessarily the companies that do the best. You have to have expertise in so many different areas. And I think you're right. Having a flexible approach, because the other thing that I've seen is, is companies starting out with a particular idea in mind, but they've remained flexible as they've moved forward and learned and they've managed that they've managed to change direction and stay alive. I mean, Amazon wasn't what it intended to be, what it is today when it started. They've, they've changed directions a number of times. Oh, absolutely. Been, been very successful. You know, people don't realize how many of these companies that we just idolize right now that are like dominating the market started with a totally different focus. Like yeah. Amazon actually kind of, they started out right. Like they, they, they started with books, which were very simple. They kind of proved their model and then they expanded outwards. But now they're everywhere. Like they're cloud hosting, everything. Like you would have never imagined what they yeah. are today from where, where they started. And they wouldn't books. have imagined back then. They didn't have that vision of everything that they're doing No, today, no, they I'm didn't. Sure. They couldn't. It would no. be impossible. They would be, you know, they would yeah. have to see the future. But, you know, let's take a company like YouTube, like we all know YouTube and we all say, oh, those guys started off with the idea. We're going to be the biggest, you know, uh, video portal in the world, you know, where everybody's going to come to watch and, and upload videos. They didn't. They actually started as a video dating site and it wasn't working like nobody wanted to video date, especially when they were doing it. And but what they found out doing that was that the mechanism they had created for uploading videos simply yes. could be used for sharing videos. And there was a huge pent up demand of people who wanted, had their first smartphone and wanted to share videos. So that simple thing led to what YouTube is today. And yeah. Google, Good. like everybody thinks Google started out, you know, you know, it's the most profitable company in the world. But when they started, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, they thought they were doing a nonprofit. They actually believed it because they were focused on helping academics find research papers online. So it's a yes. very niche market. They didn't know like Google does everything today, right? They had no idea where they were going to go. But in the process, they figured it out. And I think it's both humbling, but also really telling for entrepreneurs because I see so many entrepreneurs out there that stick with the same idea too long. Like it's just yeah. not working, but they don't want to get, they, they think it's failing to switch. Like they think it's failing to stop yes. doing what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I admire people that have got that determination and motivation to keep going. But I think sometimes they've just got to stop and step back and, and use that energy, but realize they have to change. If it's not working, there's probably a reason for it and they need, they need to change that. I think you must have seen a lot of um, slide decks looking for investment. I've, I've seen more than most, and I guess you've probably seen a few yourself. What are the key mistakes you see in those? Because... Honestly, and I'm talking to a, a lot of the, the audience, I think the majority are awful. They just are really so poor. Now and again, I see a really good one that makes me sit up, but the majority are putting together slide decks that they're hoping, you know, this could be the most important slide deck they ever put forward. It's either to sell their product or to find investment, and they're appalling. You know, they just don't communicate. You, you are absolutely right. I have seen a gazillion slide decks. Yes. Like, it's just yeah. more than I could ever count. But yeah. there are some critical mistakes people make. Now, yeah. number one, they get too focused a lot of times on their technology. Like they'll have yeah. slide after slide on this technology and this yeah. software, or whatever it is. And it's because of the people that are putting these presentations together and the ones that they come from a technical background. So they're going to talk tech. That's, that's the key problem. And they've got to be aware of that. You know, I'm not saying that's bad. You've got to have that technology, but you've also got to be able to say, hang on a minute, I might be overdoing this a bit. <laughs> yeah, and as an investor, I'm like, okay, you have great technology. Like, that's enough. Just stop yeah. there. Like, yes. what, what, 
It, I don't care about the technology itself. What does it do for the customer? So this is what I want to see. What does yeah. it do for the customer? And uh, is that a really, have, can you demonstrate to me in this deck that that is a really strong need they have that like is just so compelling that they are going to go out and get your software no matter what, because it solves um, one of their most critical problems or yeah. allows them to do something in their business that they were unable to do before. So a lot of, so that's one thing, like that's the number one thing. The number two thing is a lot, a lot of times they put together these decks, they just make them too wordy, like too much. Oh, yes. You, you know, right? Yes. You know, like, yes. we, let's be honest, you and I, and every other venture capitalist I know, um, we don't want to read. <laughs> we, it's, it's, it's counterproductive because what you're doing, I mean, the idea of typically their PowerPoint, but it doesn't matter what they're using, is, is you want to be able to show something visual. Otherwise, you just have a conversation. Or yes. if it's just words, send them a Word document and say, read that. But if it's a presentation, then it should be visual. And if you've got a visual with just loads and loads of bullet points, your brain is listening and reading and you're looking at visuals as well, and you're getting multi-channel, and and it and it doesn't work. I mean, it should be a visual. I always say six words on a slide, no more. That's what I say. So I say the same thing. I say it in my book. You know. So oh I really? Started, yeah, I think you know. Keep it down. I, I knew that, like, Steve. I knew that. <laughs> you read it. Yeah. I know. Page page fifty three, wasn't it? <laughs> so, um, really, it, visual. And you know, today people should be creating videos. Honestly, yeah. you should. If you really want to get an investor's attention, because investors are going through a gazillion of these, right? And we're just like yeah. going really fast. You want to catch us? Just pitch us. Like it's yeah. so much more compelling than us going through a deck. And pitch us, like get on there, just start telling us exactly what your product does for the customer. That's what we want to see. And then we want to see, you know, we want to hear from the customers. Maybe put them in the video. Like, what is it doing for them? Why Absolutely. Are they I, think it's a, I think it's a great idea. And, and I think the other thing that I see also is they they carry on about the technology they'll put in a bit of market research information that they've oh. found on the internet and they tend to overdo that yeah you want to show that you understand the size of the market okay we get that but keep that to a minimum make it presentable but then demonstrate how are you going to sell the stuff how are you going to do the sales and the marketing because you could have the best product in the world if you can't sell it forget it it's of no value exactly it's of no value right we yeah. you know i I've seen entrepreneurs who've spent years perfecting a product. Like they have every feature, everything you could ever want in that product, but it doesn't matter at the end. Like, yeah. you know, they, they haven't figured out how to sell it. They haven't figured out all these other things. So they're just sitting on this. You sure. know, if you, if you build the best mousetrap, people will not necessarily come. No. I, I, I hundred percent agree with that. And uh, I, I, have a, I have a story, it's unrelated to the software sector actually, is I'm a very keen photographer and I was approached by somebody who said that they wanted to sell my photographs that they'd seen and they were designing a website and they were predicting that they would be able to sell lots and lots of, of my photographs. And he negotiated a deal with me and I was waiting for him to launch the website. And six months went by and I sent him an email and he said, no, we're still working on the website. A year went past, 18 months, two years. When he finally released it, nothing happened. He didn't sell a single image and he'd worked on it for two years. <laughs> all of that discussion, <laughs> all of the work that he'd done. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, taking the mickey out and putting fun at him. You know, he worked very, very hard at it and he had an idea but I think he needed to get to test it a little bit before that. Um, that is unless a you sell problem. it. Oh. That is a classic problem. You know, people yeah. just, they fall in love with what they're doing. They don't really engage with the outside world. They have, no. you know, they just are in their own bubble building this thing. And almost invariably it won't work. Like it yeah. won't work unless really the, the only time I see it does work is if you are the exact customer and you really, really understand what, what, people like you need and there's a lot of other people like yes. who are yeah. like you and really want this. There, there are always exceptions and there have yes. been there have been apps and there have been things that have gone viral because yes. it's, it's the right product at the right time but we're talking about a very small percentage and I think I've seen too many slides is we're not good at sales and marketing so we're going to sell via partners and that's their that's their sales and marketing pitch as to how they're going to do it. We're going to sell via oh. partners. How does that work? Well, the partners will sell it for you. Why will they sell it for you? That is, oh. in, in we're going to give plan, them 30% margin. <laughs> yeah. In a business plan, that's the kiss of death. 
Like, <laughs> yeah. If you're if you're relying on partners to sell your product, I'm 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 gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I agree with that. So, what are the type of of startups that you're looking for? What would get you excited? We've we've spoken about some of the things that would fail. What would really get you excited? So, what really gets me excited? I will tell you. So, like you, I'm really interested in software, and I, you know, I look at the team. I look at everything we've discussed so far, yep. and then I look at validation from the customer. But there's another element that, that I really want to see in that most of the companies that are incredibly successful today have a, a similar business model, and that is recurring revenue. They don't sure. get yeah. a customer and just have them pay them once and go away. Like no. you do that, very hard to scale a business, you know, yeah. because you're always having to acquire new customers and it, it gets very expensive for yeah. you to do that. So these are the things I want to see in their business. Number one, I want to see that when they bring in a customer, that customer continually engages with whatever they're doing. And continually through that engagement, it, it creates value for the customer. Ah, okay. So yes. So I think what you're saying something slightly different to what I would think you were saying, because yes. if, you're, if you're offering a SaaS model and people are buying your software on a monthly subscription, that, that is one thing. Yes. What you're saying is that you win those customers and they stay customers because they're getting satisfaction from the software. There's, do you see what I mean? You can offer the model, but if you're not, if it, if you're not giving a good service and, and quite often, you, you know, you need to make sure that you've got happy customers, you can lose those customers quite quickly. Just having a monthly subscription, people can turn it off just as easy. Right. It's a click of a button away, right? The competitor yeah. is a click away. So yeah. Proof. it's... Well, I do like the recurring revenue model, number one, but that's not enough, right? Yeah. You, you've got to keep those people in your ecosystem. So really, when I look at companies to invest in, I want them, they're, they're building a whole ecosystem. So how can I bring in people, customers, other partners that create value within this ecosystem? And the more they participate, the more value they create for everyone who's participating. Got it. That is those type of companies are really hard to displace and the, it locks everybody in, right? Because, because the, once you create value in a specific platform, you can't take that with you, right? No. So the more value you create that you can't export to somewhere else, the, the stronger the barriers are uh, for your business, for, for competitors to actually start to steal your business. So, you, so that could also be more of a a business ecosystem or a business platform where you're able to feed many different types of partners. They're all benefiting from what you offer. You may be offering part of the solution or all of the solution, but that ecosystem feeds many people, feeding yeah. many, many times of businesses. Exactly. And I'll give you an example. So yeah. Salesforce, right? CRM, yeah. you know, they yeah. started in CRM. Today, I would argue that Salesforce alone, just what they built, isn't the best solution for everybody like it because there are cheaper ones for sure yep. there are easier to use ones for sure you yep. know there are uh, one specialized that, specialized crm systems specialized one but what salesforce did which is really smart is they brought in all these third parties right developers yep. and they start creating pieces in this ecosystem that when somebody joins it they start using this third party and that third party yes. and this and that and before they know it they can't take all those with them to the next guy who comes up with a better interface, a better, you know, a, a faster yeah. system or a cheaper system. It it's becomes sticky. Working. It's sticky. They're totally locked in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So when you invest, you invest at a very early stage. What typical, I mean, what are the ranges, uh, the amounts that you would be looking to invest and, and what would be a typical deal structure? Oh, so Typically, uh, what we do is we invest early. So we can invest anywhere from a, as little as like $10,000 to you know, a few hundred thousand dollars in that range. Yes. And what we're looking for is, you know, we get, usually we do it on convertible notes or safe you know, notes yeah. that we, we come in early and we let the later d investors define the value of the company. But we get, okay. you know, we usually have a cap on the value and then we have a discount. So we get rewarded for coming in early. That's, yes. that's, that's how we do it. And, and our primary mission 
is we want these companies that are, we can literally take up our funnel. So we have a venture funnel, right? So we come in at the very beginning, but then we have all these other partners in the funnel who are later stage investors, who are seed rounds, pre-series A, series A, series B, and so on. And our goal is to kind of pick the ones that work with our later investors, because if we can't help them get a later a follow-on investment later on as they make progress, then more often than not, they don't succeed. What about consultants and people that can help those tech and software companies? Because one of the things that, that I've, I, I do with my clients is by recommending the right people. And that actually is very hard because they, may, you don't, they don't necessarily need that in-house expertise, but they may need it for a short period of time. It could be around product development. It could be around particular aspects of marketing. Marketing is such a vast subject now. Is Do you handle that as well? Do you offer that? Yeah, we have a huge network of professionals and mentors that come in. A lot of times we'll have mentors that will engage with the startups at an early stage, give them some advice. They might be a marketing expert in a certain area and we will connect them. And so they will come and give them some free advice. And then if the startup really finds that they click with that person and that person can add a lot of value, uh, then they will start working together. And okay. we do make those introductions all the time, because like you said, it's, you know, for these early stage startups, especially, they shouldn't be hiring a full-time marketing person because no. they don't even have a marketing budget, really. They just yes. have a little bit of money to test their product but they yes. want to test it in the right way. So they should bring in a consultant to come in with them for a few weeks, help them figure out how to do some targeted marketing in just the right way. And then you know, to get the results they need. Same with legal, you know, there are big law firms out there that charge enormous amounts of money. That, yeah. And then there are these boutique law firms that are really expert, like just as good as the big ones, but they don't have the brand, but we will introduce them to them because they're much lower cost. Things and it's like being, <clears throat> being able to bring in the right level of person for the level of development of the company, because at different stages, you're going to need a different type of person to bring in the right level of expertise. That's important as well. At the oh, early yeah. stages, it's going to be quite different to a company that's been going for a few years and maybe has a revenue of 10 million. Oh, yeah. They're going to need different level of expertise. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. And we're so, really focused on that early stage. And then we let the investors yes. come in later, uh, figure out the, the next set. So how many companies are you working with currently in that, that uh, startup so stage? We, you know, at any one time, uh, we are working with over a hundred companies. So right. that's uh, both in our US Silicon Valley yes. uh, operations, but we also have operate, we partner with a lot of incubators and accelerators overseas. And yep. then we have our own, like we have five founder space incubators in China right now. So operating in like Xi'an, Hangzhou, Shenzhen, Wuhan, cities like that. Okay. And, and is the, is, do you have a platform where people can connect in the different areas and can communicate with each other? We do. So uh, we connect all our partners together. We have our founder space platform. We also have a, an investor network platform called foundersedge.com, where we connect all of our entrepreneurs with investors. Okay, that sounds interesting. Been very interesting. Have you, have you got another book planned? So you've got Surviving the Startup. Have you got one for the next stage of after the start off, a startup, yeah, so how to, how to grow actually, fast or something? <laughs> I actually wrote, well, I, Surviving a Startup is my second book. My first okay. book is actually Make Elephants Fly, and each... <laughs> Good title. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. it. The elephant is your big idea. And it yeah. seems impossible. You want to make it fly. You want to get it off the ground. So how do you do it? And it's about that process of innovation. So how startups and how big corporations can innovate the whole process at a very early stage and, and take that all the way to market. So that's Make Elephants Fly. And then I have another book that just came out also. Right. Okay. I've been very prolific over you this have. COVID period. The, <laughs> Uh, the other book is called The Five Forces That Change Everything. And it is all about technology and how technology is going to reshape society and business in the coming decades. So it's about all these new technologies, some of which we talked about, you know, the brain computer interfaces, virtual reality, augmented reality, AI, how they're all going to reshape everything we do. It's the exciting times we're living through at the moment, isn't it? I love it. I can't do yeah. it like you, like you probably, you love your business. I know it. Yeah. You love engaging because there's so many new things coming. We're always having to learn. We're always yeah. being challenged. Even my own ideas. Like I, I think I know a lot and then I'm always humble. Like somebody comes Absolutely. by 
with yeah there, there's always so much to learn and i find that that's very stimulating i find that's one of the really interesting things i think you know as you've been in an industry and you gain experience that's that's great because there are certain things that you know are very useful in gaining experience but the thing about this industry is it changes so quickly you never stop learning and that's what we want i know i know i do i want something to stimulate the mind um and it's been very stimulating talking to you today uh stephen so Thank if somebody you, somebody wants to reach out to you what's the best way to uh contact you super easy to get a hold of me just go to founderspace.com you can find me we have actually lots of free materials a startup kit a whole online program videos for entrepreneurs and if you want to reach me on like LinkedIn or any of the other social networks, just search for Founderspace. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your time today. I've enjoyed the conversation. You were a very lively uh, guest on the bus here, and that's what hopefully the audience want. And um, I think you made some really good points. So that's been great. Thank you, Mark. It's been wonderful. Thanks a lot, Stephen. So... That is the Bossit podcast. Um, as you hear, I have a wide range of guests that come on. And um, that was great from Stephen. If you've got a story to tell, if you've got a particular area of the software industry that you would like me to delve into, I'm happy to do that. If I know nothing about it, I'll find somebody who does and I'll bring them on. So until next time, thank you very much for listening and take care of yourself. Goodbye. 